Welcome to the regular meeting of the Yuma County Board of Supervisors. We'll be sitting as all, all special taxing districts. This is a May 17, 2021, 9 a.m. meeting. Uh, I guess all board members are in, in person. So this is a call to order. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Will everybody please stand up and follow Supervisor Bank person? Would you please join me in the pledge? I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America. America. And, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, the first item in the agenda is actually call to the public. Call to the public is held for the public's benefit to allow individuals to address issues within the board's jurisdiction. Board members may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to Arizona revised statutes, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to criticism, or scheduling the matter for further discussion and a decision at a future date. Anyone who's concerned about COVID-19 and does not want to be put into an open setting can submit an email, call to the public statement at public comment uh, at yumacountyaz.gov. This email form to public comment will be accepted until 8 a.m. the morning of the meeting. All public comments will be read out loud during the Yuma County Board of Supervisors meeting that starts at 9 a.m. Christy, do we have any? We have none. Thank we you. None. All right. Uh, so I suppose that people are here um, that want to talk. I have one uh, form, uh, and it is about the uh, fee, transfer fee. So I guess we'll take that up in a few minutes and, and, and get you in. Um, the next item in the agenda is presentations, proclamations, and appointments. Uh, in the first one, um, during this segment of the agenda, board members may discuss the presentations and proclamations and may announce appointments to the Yuma County Planning and Zoning Commission and the Yuma County Board of Adjustments. No legal action will be taken. Uh, and we'll begin with the presentation of the county line by Yuma 77, the Yuma County Government Channel. Budget season is in full swing. We'll update you on the process. Elections and voter services have been out educating area high schools on the election process. And our health district is holding vaccine clinics through the month of May. These stories and more, this is your County Line. It's that time of year when many cities and counties in Arizona are presenting their budgets for consideration. On May 3rd and 4th, the Board of Supervisors held special budget sessions. During these sessions, the county administrator, along with the budget review team, revealed their projected budget for fiscal year 21-22. Your county supervisors heard from all county departments, agencies, and special groups. During this time, the directors and representatives were able to speak to the board about the budget the Yuma County budget team had formulated for the upcoming fiscal year. Here in Yuma County, we have a 10-year long-range financial plan that we present to the board so they can see the impact of their decisions for one year, what that impact is over the next 10 years. So they can make informed decisions today that are going to have long-term benefits and not be detrimental in the long term. With all of the uncertainties surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic last year, the county budgeted very conservatively for fiscal year 2021. The county has since begun to rebound, resulting in a healthy fund balance of one-time funds to start the year. The Board of Supervisors will discuss and provide direction on any changes they would like to see made. June 7th, the Board will adopt a tentative budget, and final approval of the budget will follow on June 28th. Yuma County's election and voter services are bringing a real-life voting experience to some area high schools. Working closely with the schools, election services use student information to check them in on electronic voting poll pads. Once checked in, students were provided their correct ballot style according to grade level. They voted on electronic ballot marking devices and tabulated their voted ballots with the Vote Center tabulators. 
This vote center experience is especially important for high school students because they are about to go into adulthood where they are going to be voting for who's representing us in the community. And having this vote center experience takes a lot of the uncertainty out of not knowing how to vote. The entire process mimics an actual local, state, or federal election. Voter registration also attended, allowing for future voters to register if interested. This experience is designed to help young people become more familiar with the election process. Many current high school sophomores, juniors, and seniors will be eligible to vote in the 2022 election. The Yuma County Public Health Services District will be holding vaccine clinics on Tuesdays and Thursdays throughout the month of May. In an effort from the state to achieve the goal of herd immunity, the Health District has expanded the eligibility of COVID-19 vaccines to all Yuma County residents. The more people we get vaccinated, the more people aren't going to uh, contract COVID and aren't going to pass it on to, to other people who are vulnerable, like, you know, older or el elderly population, uh, people with uh, comorbidities such as diabetes and things like that. So if you can get vaccinated and you want a J&J &J or a Moderna, we're, we're offering that right now here at the health department. Each Tuesday in May, the Johnson & Johnson One Dose Vaccine will be offered from 8.30 to 11.30 a.m. On each Thursday, the Moderna vaccine, two doses, will be offered, also from 8.30 to 11.30 a.m. If you're interested in getting your COVID-19 vaccine, you must make an appointment by calling 317-4550. Hi, I'm Mary, and this is your Health Watch. Is here and what better way to cool off than in the water? Pools, rivers, and lakes are all popular choices here in Yuma. However, they can also be very dangerous if we are not careful. Here are some tips to make sure you stay safe while having fun in the sun. The letter A stands for active adult supervision. Always keep constant visual supervision for all children and be within arm's reach of infants and toddlers. Designate a water watcher who is in charge of watching the children while in or near water. Next up is the letter B, which stands for barriers. Make sure the pool is separated from other play areas of the home by having the pool surrounded by a four-sided fence, a self-closing, self-latching gate, and door alarms on any door that opens to a body of water. The final letter is C. C stands for classes, CPR, and first aid classes. Swimming lessons and water safety classes help to make sure everyone knows what to do in an emergency and increases the chances of survival. Congratulations, you now know your ABCs of water safety. For more information on water safety for open water, please visit www.safekids.org. That is all for now. Stay healthy, Yuma. Before we head out, don't forget that we have a holiday just around the corner. Memorial Day is an American holiday honoring the men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military. Memorial Day weekend is upon us, and most of your county offices will be closed Monday, May 31st, in observance of this holiday. All offices will be back open for regular business hours on Tuesday, June 1st. We'd like to thank you for joining us for this County Line. If you'd like to watch past episodes, log on to yumacountyaz.gov forward slash VOD. And don't forget, you can join us live on Facebook. We'd like to leave you now with a message from Yuma County employee Jessica Fram, telling us why she loves working for Yuma County. My name is Jessica Fram. I'm a licensed fiduciary with Yuma County Public Fiduciary's Office, and I have been working with Yuma County uh, for almost eight years. So a typical day includes following up on any issues that we become aware of with our uh, clients, following up with any medical needs, financial needs, contacting agencies that work with our clients, making sure that we're advocating for each and every need that they have. We have a team of people here who genuinely love each and every client they serve, and you can see that in the passion of their work. Well, you know, the vice chair has reminded me we don't have an item to discuss uh, the transfer fee. So this, I'm going to take this in the open to the public section. And again, I remind everyone, if you are in the open to the public section, all we can do is listen to what you have to say and sort of react to it at, at, at a meeting. So 
Uh, we're not going to have a presentation, are we? No? no. Then I'd like to ask Mr. Pasconelli, Mike Pasconelli, Mike, if you could come up. forward and, uh, you know, just address us on whatever issues. I guess the issue is the transfer fee. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just have one oh, more. Right, somebody else. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, my name is Mike Pascal. I am the president of the Yuma Fresh Vegetable Association. Uh, we saw the article in the paper regarding the possible transfer fees for your transfer site stations. Um, and it, as an association, before you go on, Mr. Yes. Pascal, you can take your mask off. It, it, I mean, everybody, it sounds a little, it sounds so muffled. I mean, not a problem. It's tough, it's tough to not get used to it. But. I understand. So. Um, we just have some concerns if there are some transfer fees that are brought in for the or fees for the transfer sites being from the farming community and seeing everything illegal dumping is very much a problem that we have in farmlands and in our waterways. Um, I know from first hand knowledge, I farm right around the transfer site in the North Gila and illegal dumping happens on my farm and in my canals all the time. We have a lot of concern on food safety with, we don't know what can, kind of contaminants that we can have that maybe some oil, some gas, anything, tires, any of the ways or things getting into our crops. And so we just wanna give our concerns on if there are some fees, people may be looking to do illegal dumping in our site, other places other than in your sites. And so we just wanna express our concerns for our farming because as you know, agriculture is such a big business in this county. Thank you, Mr. Right. Um, we we've made aware of, of the concerns of the Grow Association too. I mean, they they also have concerns, and we understand that. So, we, and again, we can't get into talking about. No, that. I understand. I, I understand that. Thank so, you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Tom Davis. Thank you. I appreciate uh, getting to make these comments. I'm here because I also read the article in the paper. Uh, and I'm the general manager of Yuma County Water Users Association. We provide water to all the farmland in Yuma Valley. Um, and we've petitioned in the past uh, to get a transfer station somewhere in the Yuma Valley because we have hundreds of miles of canals and open drains that are fertile dumping grounds for everyone that comes along from tires to refrigerators to discarded cook stoves. Just to give you an idea, um, last year alone, our dumping fees at the dump site was $10,700. Our labor cost to pick up all of these materials, and this, this doesn't include the tires. This is just other things that we picked up. The tires are, are a separate item. Uh, direct labor costs, $30,600 that we spent picking up dumped items from our canal roads, from our drain ditches. Um, my concern when I read that in the paper of, of you, I understand the, your position there. It, it costs to manage these transfer stations, I'm sure. But if you start charging a fee, I think they're just going to be more dumping outside the transfer stations. I would like to see a couple transfer stations in there in the Yuma Valley, it would really help us. I've coordinated with the city of San Luis, the city of Summerton. We're working now, we're closing some roads, we're trying to control dumping within those city limits, but there's a heck of a lot of that land out there that we service that's county land. And if you, I think if you do anything to increase the cost, it's just gonna increase the illegal dumping that's going on there. And you can see there from this cost, we pay quite a bit of money to, to do that. And we, you know that's part of what we're responsible for, but we sure don't want to take on any more of that. Thank you. I just want to say something as a comment, and that is that whenever we discuss the transfer fees, we discuss enforcement, because at the end of the day, enforcement is so difficult to do. It may be more costly to enforce it, to enforce that no dumping than it would be to just sort of adapt to what the cost, is, the cost increases would be. But but staff is just, we're tasked with bringing it, bringing it back to us because it keeps getting bigger. It's it might have started, you know, 10 years ago as a $30,000 thing, but it's now 100,000 and it keeps growing. One of the things I have my folks do is if they can find any 
addresses, any phone numbers, any information, we contact deputy sheriffs for that area, and they do try to pursue that on our behalf and on the behalf well, of the Well, thank you very much for your comments. We you bet. appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, we're going to thank you again for your comments, and you know, we'll take them into account. Um, there will be a date set for that, you know, so I want to make sure that the gentlemen know when that's going to happen. Um, okay, all right. Uh, the next item in the agenda is the proclamation proclaiming the week of May 16 to the 22nd as Public Works Week in Yuba County, and this will be done by Supervisor Simmons. <clears throat> proclaiming the week of May 16 to the 22nd, 2021, as Public Works Week in Yuma County, whereas Yuma County Public Works employees provided services to our community and are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public works systems and programs such as streets and highways, solid waste collection and improvement districts, and whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services, and whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities as well as their planning, design, and construction are vitally dependent upon the efforts and skills of public works officials, and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who provide public work services and materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now, therefore, proclaim this week of May 16th through the 22nd, 2021 as Public Works Week in Yuma County and encourage all citizens, businesses, public and private, agencies and media, to equate themselves with the issues involving our public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. All right. Um, that's the proclamation. And you would like to say a few words before we turn it over to you? Chairman, uh, members of the board, Josh Scott, Public Works Director. Um, this year's theme for National Public Works Week is Stronger Together. By working together with our community, our partners, and our residents, um, we look to improve the quality of life in Yuma County through our infrastructure and uh, working to improve that. And we appreciate recognizing the role that our public works professionals play in uh, trying to make Yuma County a, a better place to live for all of us. Uh, it truly is a team effort, and this week is about our, our professionals in public works. Uh, everybody from our, our road crews out there patching potholes to our mechanics keeping the county's fleet on the road. And, uh, again, thank you. And uh, let's go down there and give them the proclamation. Mm -hmm. Never stop being a teacher, huh? Certainly needy. <laughs> Certainly a little needy there. That's all this. Yeah. Well, now you pass the old mask now, right? Yeah, I will. I, as a matter of fact, I will. Do, I'll say them today. Thank you. Okay. The, so the next proclamation is uh, it's a proclamation proclaiming this month Bicycle Month in Yuma County. Uh, Supervisor, no. what's his last name? Yeah. Supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> John and Jonathan uh, will read the proclamation. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Proclaiming the month of May 2021 <laughs> as Bicycle Month in Yuma County, whereas the bicycle is an economical, healthy, convenient, and environmentally sound form of transportation, and whereas Yuma County road and trail system attracts bicyclists each year, providing economic health, transportation, and tourism, and whereas a bicycle is an excellent tool for recreation and the enjoyment of Yuma County's scenic beauty, beauty 
And whereas the Yuma Regional Yuma Region Bicycle Coalition has joined with local organizations to promote bicycle tourism year round, attracting visitors to enjoy our local restaurants, hotels, retail establishments, and cultural and scenic attractions. And these groups also promote greater public awareness of bicycle operation and safety education in an effort to reduce collisions, injuries, and fatalities to improve health and safety for everyone on the road. Now, therefore, Yuma County proclaims the month of May 2021 as the Bicycle Month in Yuma County. All right, Mr. Bicycle, would you come up, please? <laughs> hold, hold a minute. You got the podium. Another beautiful day in Yuma County. Oh, take my mask off. Yeah. Gene Dalby, 1183 West 37th Street. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. That was excellent. You did a great job. Thank you. And you and you covered um, about 70% of the things about bicycling. You know, there are 60 benefits to riding bicycles, and I have a list of them that I pass around. I've seen, I've all seen it one time or another. And um, the, the amazing thing about that list is that when you get on a bicycle and you put your foot on the pedal and begin to move, you get all 60 benefits at one time. And that's amazing. Most of the time, we think about benefits that come with certain activity, and we get a little of this or a little of that or a little of something else. But you get environmental benefits with bicycling, you get health benefits with bicycling, you get economic benefits with bicycling. And I don't know what other activity can really provide so many opportunities all the way across the board. We know throughout the country that bicycling has exploded in the way of a business. It's so hard to get bicycles these days of a quality that people really want to ride. Walmart still has them, Kmart has them, some of the other stores have them. But the real bike shops that look at really quality bikes, it's hard to get. And you're getting on a six month order, back order. Parts for bicycles these days are difficult to get a hold of. So we at Crossroads Mission are also having a bike shop and we have an excellent part inventory that's used parts, but nevertheless still operational to one degree or another. So bicycling is booming in Yuma, Yuma County, and uh, Thank you for taking notice of it and look forward to working with you in the future. And you know, there, there are very few times, Gene, when a person, a single individual, has such a big impact as you have had on the bicycling situation in Yuma County. I mean, I, I've seen it grow. I, I myself personally have seen it particularly grow, and I've seen just how, much, how committed you are to this, and, and congratulations. Well, it's not about me. I know it's not. I, about it's you. about the people living in Yuma County and about the tourism that comes to Yuma County. Well, someone has to do the job, and you've done it over the years. I'll so thank you, you very much, too, Mr. Chairman. I, just to throw a little, add a little of what he was saying. Um, we buy bikes for fishing dirt, donate them for prizes. Mm -hmm. We tried to get them last year. We could not find them anywhere. I right. mean, it took us a while to be able to find the bikes to donate because Walmart, all these places were out. That's a blatant well, Chinese. Yuma County, they give us the wonderful 40 bicycle donation of all the bicycles that were in the evidence department or whatever they collect them at or something. Come over. Thank you. Now we could have designated the Chinese for that. Hold on. 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 Thank you, Gina. Again, for the Thank you. Thank you. Little slim and trim. Thank you again. And um, I think that the last thing, it's an Arizona public on, on the proclamations and appointments and presentations is a presentation or an update from Arizona Public Service regarding maintaining reliability during the summer months. Regina Tomey? Tomey? Tomey. Tomey, yeah. Throws everyone off. Yeah, public affairs manager. <laughs> Southwest Division will provide a PowerPoint presentation. Um, well, Regina, the floor is yours. For allowing me to present it's nice to be here in person finally uh, so, yeah with no mask so uh, today will be short and sweet I'm going to talk to you about summer um, preparedness I'll give a brief 
um, 2020 recap, and then I'll update you on a few projects that you're probably aware of. Well, we'll be done. So let's see if I can, here we go. As you can see, our service territory is widespread throughout Arizona. Um, many of our areas are rural Arizona. We serve 11 of the 15 counties. We have over 34,000 square miles of service, and we serve about 1.3 million customers throughout the state. Um, for some other numbers, we have nearly 500 substations, roughly 300,000 transformers, and more than 550,000 poles and structures around the state. Last year, we set out to provide 100% clean, carbon-free electricity to customers by 2050. This plan is guided by sound science, and it's focused on achieving environmental and economic gains while maintaining affordable and reliable service. We have a closer goal, a 2030 goal, which targets achieving a resource mix that is 65% clean energy with 45% of our generation portfolio coming from a new renewable energy. We plan to end all coal-fired generation by 2031, which is seven years sooner than we had previously projected. We want to increase energy storage, which you'll see with our battery project here in Yuma, and then support transition with natural gas and obviously help continue economic growth in Arizona. For project updates throughout the county, which is um, probably more important to you, the Orchard substation is well underway. That is on South Avenue 5 um, and a half E and East County 14th Street. It should be up and running in service by the end of the year. Pacific Avenue substation is near, near Yuma Palms, and that's replacing a temporary sub. Work is in progress to have that sub completed by the end of next year. And then finally, battery storage in the foothills, which I know Supervisor Simmons um, is aware of, in the foothills and Hyder areas. This is a project we were going to start a few years ago. We put it on hold. We just had our first kickoff meeting last week to talk about special use permits and things like that. Um, the, this should be in service by 4 uh, of 2022. This extra battery storage will increase the reliability, especially when the sun goes down. So obviously solar is really great during the day, not so much at night. So we want to have battery storage so that we can improve reliability in the county. For summer preparedness, just a general overview, and I'll go through them a little bit um, more detail. Generation resources and transmission capacity is in place to meet customer load and reserve requirements for the summer months. Infrastructure improvements are on schedule. Maintenance efforts um, should be completed by the end of the month. Coordination with external emergency management agencies. We have good relationships with Red Cross and emergency management throughout the state. We have been busy conducting internal emergency preparedness plans and training. And then a little uh, later in the presentation, I'll talk about some improvements to customer communication. So for a 2020 recap, some of you may remember we had the hottest summer on record, 53 days over 110 degrees, 14 days over 115. We set an all-time peak of 7,861 megawatts on July 30th at exactly 5.34 p.m. The temperature that day was 118 degrees. So we know that those hot temps are coming. Last summer, we broke the previous peak load record six times. Obviously, with COVID, people were home, kids were home, things were a little different, but last summer was the hottest summer on record. For 2020, 2021 peak resources and demand, the bar on the right shows this year's forecasted peak demand of 7,521 megawatts with the reserves of 1,111 for a total of 8,632. The bar uh, to the left of that shows the peak demand for 2021, and then the other side of that is 2019. So as you can see, we are increasing, but we have also increased our demand, and we're prepared to meet the needs this summer. Um, we have adequate fuel supply for all of our generating facilities. Palo Verde, as some of you may know, is the largest source of clean energy. 
We supply 70% of Arizona's clean energy through Palo Verde. Um, we have 100% um, fuel requirements contracted through 2026, and our capacity factor of 91.2024 was uh, for 2020. And just a side note on Palo Verde, once um, we get the green light, we do offer tours for community members. Um, yeah, so if you haven't been, let me know or I can reach out to you and we can get you on a tour. You uh, tour the facility, have lunch, have a presentation. It's about a half day um, trip, but it's worth it if you haven't been. And you have to be in those little white suits with the little Geiger thingy. Yes, you get the full gear, <laughs> but it is interesting. <laughs> the next slide is just kind of an FYI for you, talking about natural gas supply and transport. This slide shows two maps. The one on the left is the El Paso natural gas pipeline, and the one on the right is a transwestern pipeline. We have access to natural gas through two different gas basins, the San Juan Basin in northwest New Mexico and the Permian Basin in west Texas. Having access to these two basins and these two pipelines help, helps to mitigate gas delivery risk and enhances reliability. As far as emergency management, APS regularly coordinates with neighboring utilities, which doesn't really affect Yuma, but in the metro area, they work with the other utilities as far as uh, the other power companies, as well as various federal, state, and local agencies. We continue to maintain good relationships with emergency managers and Red Cross directors. Um, we work on emergency response and disaster recovery plans throughout the year to make sure that we are prepared for the summer months. We have drills, exercises, and load curtailment in place. We have been actively working on improving our customer focus. We have um, an outage map that will come in May or June that includes improved navigation. I think the first thing people want to know when there's an outage is when is it going to come back on. So our outage map will include restored details up to four hours after the outage. Um, people will be able to go there to see when it should um, come back on. We are also working on keeping our customers informed via email and text. Not everyone always has access to a computer, but most people have access to their phone. So we want to be able to let our customers know about outages before, during, and after, no matter how big or small the outage. We also offer ICE reimbursements, excuse me, for extended outages. So if there is an outage in your area of more than five hours, four hours, and you have to purchase gas or ice for your food, we will reimburse you. You just have to send in a copy of your receipt and you'll get your funds back. In addition, this last year, we improved our customer care center by making it 24 seven. So you can call us at three in the morning, two in the morning, one in the morning, you'll actually get a person, not a machine, to help with whatever emergency you have. And then finally, we are continuing to follow CDC guidelines. APS had very strict protocols in place for our staff. Uh, we obviously wanted to make sure our staff were safe so that they could keep the lights on. Um, we are slowly easing some of those restrictions, but we are still being very cautious and ensuring our staff are prepared and protected in order to keep the lights on. And finally, my last slide, um, last year we were very busy. We also created an APS promise. The APS promise is an internal commitment for our external facing or for our external customers. We want to create a sustainable energy future for Arizona. We will serve clean, reliable, and affordable electricity to our customers, and we value our strong partnerships. In addition to our APS promise, we continue to work on maintaining better relationships with our communities, presentations like this, having a more personal touch with elected officials, with community members. We do offer community impact grants to various nonprofits. Um, so we really wanna work on maintaining and improving that relationship. And on that note, the last slide has several contacts for you. Save these, put them in your phone, there is uh, my number. If you have outage questions, um, general information questions, grants or community partnerships, you can text me at any time. Charlie Molina, who is uh, the head of um, the, the lineman, so if there are construction or building questions or lineman questions, he can help you. And then Danny Ortega, who is here in the back, and most of you know, 
you can reach out to for higher level projects or planning and scheduling questions. So save those direct numbers, reach out to us, and we'll be very responsive. Regina, thank you very much. One question. Um, in the, because I noticed that you mentioned relationships with towns, cities and towns, do you have to get a franchise from each one of them? We do. We do. So not counties or... So, <laughs> so, okay, well, I mean, you know, you should put counties on your mission. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, will, I will let marketing know to add that. Yeah, right, <laughs> yes. You know, you do right. have relationship with counties, cities, yeah. and towns. Uh, I, I just want to compliment APS because a lot of times, especially out in East County, a lot of people don't realize that there's a break. East County is served by the Phoenix line. It's not a local line. Uh -huh. And uh, when they lose power out there, uh, you're very quick to jump in with ice, water, whatever, because there's sometimes there's days without power because they are on the tail end of the line. But I just want to compliment you guys on the, the job you do out yeah. there and helping them, uh, you know, get through the, the tough parts, especially in the summertime. Thank you so much. And, and, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Um, what if, if do you have people who can't afford to, to pay their electric bill? Um, which one of you guys would, uh, would be contacted? You could contact me, and I will get you in touch with customer service. We have a couple different programs available. Um, they can apply for a reduction in their bill if they meet certain criteria. And then we also do give funds through with third party nonprofits um, up to $800 a year for people who can't pay. I know that WACOG works with people. WACOG's like in Chicano por la Casa. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Regina, a couple of well, more comments and questions. Um, I mean, you're relatively new to the system, but I was a former mayor of San Luis, and as a former mayor of Summers, and I can tell you that in the past, we had a lot of trouble with uh, actually creating a circle or basically creating a network that, you know, when a power pole went out in the past, the whole city would be out of, out of service. And I think it, you know, it happened to Summerton sometimes. Uh, so, you know, we're, I, I know the community of San Luis is really grateful, to, you know, on the fact that you came in from a different way, a different angle, so that in reality, I haven't seen a, a citywide block you know, blackout in a long time. Good, so, thank you. You know, you've come a long way. So APS has come a long way. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Tell your mom, huh? That last part, edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, that, that takes care of all the presentations, proclamations, and appointments, and we will move on to the consent calendar. Now, the consent calendar uh, has items that are listed under the consent and will be considered as a group and acted upon by one motion with no separate discussion unless a board member so requests in that event the item will be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. There are, let's see how many, uh, there are nine items. Are there any, any items to be removed and discussed by any of the board members? Um, number four. Number four. Okay, so item number four. So. Item number four, so there's items one through nine. Do I hear a motion to approve uh, under the consent agenda items one through nine with the exception of number four? Mr. Mr. Yes. Second. Okay. There's been a motion and a second to approve the items as presented. Uh, all those in favor of approving those items as presented signify by stating aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on to item number four, Arizona at work. The Yuma County Workforce Development Board operated by the Arizona at work requests that the Yuma County Board of Supervisors approve the amended Yuma County Workforce Development Board by laws. Uh, I know, do you need to ask some Mr. questions? Mr. Chairman, no. I just wanted to make a comment that um, I want to thank Susan for all that work that she did to get um, Arizona at work meeting all the requirements that the state uh, says we need to meet. We're one of the few. And to thank Nydia for all the work. I serve on that committee where I am. Um, I attend all those meetings, and uh, it is so well organized, and it is it is it is being run so well. Um, thank you to you and your staff, Nydia, for all of the hard work, and um, and for the school. It um, it meets a, a a big need, and for helping people find jobs. It's a wonderful, wonderful program, both for youth and for um, unemployed adults. So um, thank you. All right. That's uh, all. Any more questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the item as presented. And again, reiterate that 
you know, there was a lot of work to be done. I'm sure that some of those board members had a lot to do with that too. Uh, so I want to thank everyone involved in the process, everybody <laughs> yes. involved in the process, especially with the leadership, because we did have some issues, some pressing issues. And uh, to, to get it this far, it's great. Thank you very much. So I have a motion I to approve. that we approve. Second. I'm going to motion a second to approve the item as presented. All those in favor of the motion signify by stating aye. Aye. Oh. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Uh, thank you, and we'll move on uh, from the consent calendar into the discussion and action items. And the first item is uh, the uh, County Administration, Public Health Services, Emergency Management, discussion and possible action regarding COVID-19 updates and activities. It is getting to a point that, um, that you report <laughs> smaller and smaller. Good morning, um, Chairman Reyes, members of the board, Diana Gomez, Director of Public Health. Um, a quick update so far in Yuma County, we have administered over 160,000 doses, meaning that, that about close to 74,000 um, Yuma County uh, residents have been fully vaccinated, which accounts roughly to about 39%. Our positivity rate has also gone down, just to give you some perspective, in December, uh, when we were experiencing those really high numbers, we were seeing a positivity rate of 33% down to what we've seen in the last week, which is 3% and continuing to trend lower. So we do know that, um, you know, all these things that we've done have been working. Um, vaccines are safe and effective. A reminder that you can get your vaccine uh, at any most participating pharmacies, um, CVS, Walgreens, they've expanded to um, Walmart. They're readily available. You can go to the state pod. The state pod now has new um, hours of operation, Wednesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Walk-ins are welcome. Um, and the health department is continuing to host uh, Johnson & Johnson clinics on Tuesdays from 8.30 to 11, and Moderna on Thursdays from 8.30 to 11. Um, some news as far as vaccine um, expanded uh, eligibility. Uh, the vaccine, Pfizer vaccine was approved for ages 12 to 15. So now that vaccine can be used um, in that age group. Uh, along those lines, the pod, you know, as, as soon as Thursday made that readily available, we've had a lot of teenagers and, and kids in that age group that have taken advantage of the vaccine. This last Saturday, we hosted a vaccine clinic for youth in um, Summerton. We, and in conjunction with the city of Summerton and San Luis, vaccinated 300 uh, teens, and we are going out to Dateland on the 21st. So we're doing that down there as well. So again, the whole point is to make sure people have access to the vaccine if they want it, and that we go out to the different part of the community to make that available. Um, the Pfizer vaccine, again, is the one that is now approved for ages 12 and up. The company is seeking to get approval for ages two and up and not just right now, all our vaccines have the emergency authorization. They're seeking to get full authorization um, as early as September. So um, that's some positive news. Um, and again, continuing to expand the clinic. In um, other news, uh, most healthcare providers that have onboarded can now readily order vaccine independently through our the, its state ACEs system. So medical provider offices can now do their own ordering and they can adjust based on whatever their needs are. Um, other um, updates include the CDC guidance saying that fully vaccinated people can now participate in indoor and outdoor activities um, without the need for physical distancing or wearing a mask. Um, so that's important guidance. Again, let's remember to um, remind people that fully vaccinated means if you are using the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, that is a two dose series. So that's two weeks after your second dose or one week after the one dose Johnson & Johnson series before you can do that. We encourage people who are not vaccinated to, again, continue to protect themselves um, by wearing a mask. But again, at this point, um, the good news is that vaccine is working. It is highly effective. Um, we've seen it work in real world scenarios. So it's, it's very um, important to continue to remind people again that that is available and it's free of charge. Now, this guidance um, does not apply across the board for every the updated guidance. Schools still you know, have some mitigation strategies in place because we know that kids, with the exception, you know, it's just 12 and over that are now eligible to be vaccinated. So you might see some additional guidance there um, stand for a while. Also, the guidance does not, the updated guidance does not apply to healthcare settings. 
So when you go to your doctor's office or when you visit the health department or the hospital, you might still be asked to wear a mask. And that's, again, a precaution. We still have, you know, I just said how, much, how many people we roughly had. I think I said 39% that are vaccinated. So we still have people, especially children or people that are immunocompromised or who have not had the opportunity to take the vaccine um, who are, you know, still at a heightened risk. So when you go to those healthcare settings, you might still see that mask requirement. We remind you to be mindful that um, when you also go to businesses or your workplace, they might have different guidelines and they might still require you to wear a mask. But again, those um, very transportation is going to expect you to wear a mask uh, for similar reasons. You have a lot of people in a very small space. And so when you travel by plane or train or any of those public transportations, they likely will still require you to wear a mask. But again, for the most part, the updated guidance is if you're fully vaccinated, you no longer need to wear a mask or socially distance unless you feel safe for doing so. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. You're still wearing one. You see? Uh, but you actually went like this. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, I got it. I got so it. <laughs> there will be some very important announcements made during this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? No, sir. Anything else from Tony? Tony is coming behind you. Better you know, get a move a little bit. <laughs> Chairman, uh, members of the uh, board, Tony Badia, emergency manager. The only thing I need to add is every week on, on Monday, we update the testing sites throughout Yuma County. Obviously, uh, we try to maintain those as, as uh, accurate as possible, and people can go to yumacounty.gov and, and see those sites. Testing is an important option for those who are unable to get uh, the shots or have not gotten the shots, so they can go and get tested. So I just wanted to sort of comment on the fact that Although it may be only 30 some percent or 40 percent of the population that has been vaccinated, I think the percentage of elderly people who have been vaccinated is much higher. Mm -hmm. And since they're the ones that were mostly impacted negatively, in other words, we, you know, they were the most seriously impacted, I think that that is having a, a much bigger impact than the fact that we have maybe 30 something or 40 percent of the people vaccinated. The people that needed the vaccine um, got it, I think, at the beginning and uh, or the most. And I think that's great. And I, I want to commend everybody that works in those departments because, you know, they have made a commitment to reach out to those areas that need the vaccine. And they, they have out, gone out and instead of waiting for people to come in, they've gone out and provided it nearby. I think every time I hear in the, in the news, the federal news, that, you know, there's a vaccination spot no, 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 no further than five miles you know, from where you live, I keep thinking, okay, well, I mean, that may be the case, but only at certain particular times. But in San Luis now, and in Somerton, uh, you know, that is truly the case. I just took my kid, my 12-year-old, I mean, my 14-year-old, she's going to get mad, my 14-year-old, and got her vaccinated in Somerton, which is 12 miles, 12 miles, but still pretty close this weekend. And uh, the fact that the vaccine's available is something that I think, uh, you know, we struggled a lot at the beginning with the availability and the way that the system was set up and when people wanted it it was so tough to get it to them and now it's going to be a matter of trying trying to convince people that, that still may not believe in its effectiveness that we've had a clinical trial of 200 million people if you had a problem with it i think you should uh, realize that if you have a problem with the testing i think or the way that <coughs> you've got to prove you have two choices one is a regular vaccine j and j which was done the regular way. You'd have a dead virus, whatever that was. And then you have a very modern, very effective, highly effective, high percentage. I think it was 100% for kids or something like that, from what I read. 100%. That is, that is stunning, as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, I didn't want to take a long time. I just wanted to make sure that we acknowledge the fact that our health department, I looked at the regional uh, lookout, and I can tell you right now, Imperial County doesn't have a high, that low of a, of an infection rate, we're the lowest in the whole region. And this is a region of millions of people, including Mexicali and San Luis Rio, Colorado. And the 2.9, 3%, it is the lowest. I think the next one was like 12 or 15 or 20%. So you, you guys are doing a great job keeping everything under some sort of control. And that is because you work, a, you make a very good team. So thank you, Tony, thank you. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Diana, Diana. Uh, I'm trying to swallow here. <laughs> Diana, thank you, Mrs. I was going to say Director Gomez to make it more formal, but then, you know, I got caught in Diana. And to thank you guys for your support throughout this whole process. All right, thank you very much, Tony. Mr. Chair? Yes. Diana and uh, um, Emergency Management and Health Department, Tony, 
um, thank you. Make sure you say thank you to your staff because they have really, really worked hard to um, make all this happen. And uh, we are down and there's no deaths. Every time I get an update from Susan, there's zero deaths. And I'm going, yes. You know, so anyway, thank you both. All right. Okay. Um, thank you both again. Uh, in the announcement I was going to make is that I'm going to I'm going to consult with the, with the legal and I'm removing the mass mandate from you know it's a proclamation it's something I can do by myself so there will be uh, some sort of notice out and I am probably going to take the mandate now that doesn't mean that everybody can't do that voluntarily but I don't it's not going to be a mandated thing and I know some departments probably think well you know. Um, that's going to make it a little difficult to manage, but I think we're getting to that time where we think, I think that people should be responsible for their actions. And I think at this particular time, we, we have done enough to make sure that people know about the risk and people know what they're supposed to do. So we're going to have to leave it up to them to do the right thing, whether they want to wear a mask or not. So I will be contacting legal, the legal department to see if it's just a matter of removing the mask mandate or if it's a matter of removing the emergency proclamation. I think the emergency proclamation allows us to do certain things and it may be necessary to continue with uh, those just to make sure we can help businesses, we can help people without having to go through a lot of process. So I'll check with legal, but as of, I don't know, as, as soon as I can, uh, that, that, that requirement that people wear a mask to come into county offices or county buildings or to be able to work inside will be uh, removed. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, thank you again to the health department and to the emergency department, and we'll move on to county administrator action to appoint individuals to the 2021 Yuma County Redistricting Advisory Commission pursuant to resolution 2021-04 and adopted on May 3rd, 2021. Yes. Good morning, Chairman Reyes, members of the board, Tiffany Anderson, Elections Director for Yuma County. This morning, I am here for you to formally appoint your members for each of your districts to the Redistricting Advisory Commission, which was put into place by the resolution adopted at the last board meeting. Okay. Does any of the board members ready to make their appointment? I am. I am. All right. So, okay, we'll begin with uh, Supervisor Pankhurst. Uh, uh, excuse me? What we would like to do, if they haven't already uh, previously been submitted to elections, just to verify eligibility, um, we'd like you to make your nomination subject to the eligibility requirements. Oh, sure. Thank you. So the nominations are going to be subject to the eligibility requirements, which would be that you're a registered voter and live in the district which you get appointed first. We will talk about the three general ones a little later, or the three, what do you call it, at large, at large, at large ones. So we'll deal with the appointments of the ones that we will appoint and they will be checked by the elections department to make sure they meet eligibility requirements. If there's a, if there's a problem, it'll come back to us. Correct. All right. So well, let's begin with yours, uh, Lynn. Um, I have uh, um, two selections, Nancy Meister and Pamela Wasama. Okay. And they have submitted applications even though it, they, it wasn't required. I think you have both of them. I have received both of them. Mm -hmm. Russell Lang. Russell McLeod and uh, Danette Garcia. Oh, I was going to deal with Russell? Ah, <laughs> that's a pain. That's pain. Can I do a proclamation last week? I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Supervisor Simmons. Uh, <laughs> he stayed uh, like that Gilbert all Hernandez. the time. Gilbert Hernandez. Under the emergency proclamation, can I get him off the commission? And Nancy Hernandez. Tucker. Huh? Gilbert, Gilbert Hernandez. Hernandez. And Nancy Tucker. Supervisor Porches? Uh, Marta Garcia and Lorena Sendeta. Uh, is Marta Garcia an elected official? Because that may disqualify her, no? Does it? And it doesn't disqualify according to the resolution as long as they're not a county employee or related right. to okay. anyone on the advisory commission or certain members of uh, Yuma County government. And I did receive uh, Supervisor Porches's submissions last week and check their eligibility so they ha they are they can okay. be appointed. Right. Was I the only one that submitted them early? No. <laughs> Just because once in a while he does follow through. <laughs> no, I was late. I okay, was late. mine. <laughs> Retract myself from this. <laughs> yeah, okay, one at a time. So you got those names, right? Yes. Or mine are uh, Mr. Jorge Duarte Jr., which I'll give you the information, and the other one is Ferny Quiroz. 
and I'll give you that information. So those are my two appointments. Ferni Quiroz and Jorge Duarte Jr. One is from Jorge San Luis, the other one's from the county, that, in my area, my district. So I'll give you the information soon. Okay. Thank Just you so much, make Chairman. The, make the appointments. Uh, thank you. I will get the follow-up information as far as these individuals' addresses directly from you to ensure that I'm checking eligibility for the correct person in the voter registration database. And I will see you back on June 7th for the at-large members. Thank you. You will. Thank you. No, I'm just kidding. You will. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Tiffany. That was less painful than I thought it would be. Uh, all right. No PowerPoint? No PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> all right. So that takes care of the appointments for the commission. Um, and so now we go to county administration for item number. Okay. That's okay. Got that. Item number uh, four, discussion of possible action regarding, no, three, excuse me. Uh, discussion of possible action regarding the America Rescue Plan Act to prioritize potential projects and programs in which the county should invest the act's funds in accordance with guidance from the U.S. Treasury. Are we ready for that? Do, do we have, do we have projects? You have, oh, you have a PowerPoint presentation, okay. Yes, I have a PowerPoint presentation for you. Uh, the National Association of Counties held a webinar recently on the American Rescue Plan Act and the guidance thus far from the U.S. Treasury. This morning, I'm pleased to share this information with the Board of Supervisors and the public. This is a table of contents for the presentation of the webinar. Yuma County is already registered on the Treasury portal, and we are awaiting delivery of funds to our special revenue account that was set up to monitor, track, and report on the use of American Rescue Plan Act funds. And as we go through this uh, presentation, I'll refer to these as ARPA funds for short. So this presentation from NACO obviously is focused on counties, but cities, towns, and tribes will also be receiving funds. This provides all of us the opportunity to join together on regional projects within Yuma County, and it's also essential that we coordinate with the cities, town, and tribes so that we're not duplicating efforts in support to outside agencies, businesses, individuals, or nonprofits. As noted in the bullets, <coughs> whoops, I'm sorry. Here we go. As noted in these bullets, there are many unanswered questions, and Treasury is providing further gu guidance in the coming days according to their information. There's also a deadline to comment on the interim rule by July 9th. So um, the interim, as listed on the right-hand side of this presentation, the interim final rule is 150 page, 151 pages. The fact sheet is attached to your agenda item. Uh, the FAQs is a list of eight um, of questions and answers from Treasury, and that's an 18-page document, which I'll share with you. The quick, quick reference guide is just a one-page that's summarized here as well. And the county recovery fund allocations we've received earlier, Yuma County's allocation is $41,525. 41 million $521,519 over a two-year period. So there, the uh, interim rule, the 151 pages, um, it, NACO suggests that we be sure to read pages 130 through 150 of the interim final rule because that includes the specific eligible use of funds. And they have a lot of terminology, whether it's shall, you must do these things, may, you have discretion, encouraging and should is, is strictly a preference and not required, and then proportional and consistent has a specific definition. So I want to make sure that this is clearly understood. This list is not the list of eligible uses. This is a list, and it's kind of confusing that way, because it says common questions on recovery funds. How can counties use recovery funds? This is listed in the FAQs, and then there's either a yes or a no about whether you can use funds for these purposes. So I want to make sure this is not a list of eligible uses, uh, because you can't, um, for instance, you can't use it as a non-federal match because it is federal funds. So you can't use it to match other federal funds. So it says non-federal match, but that's one of the unallowed uses. So I just wanted it, that to be clear. And then key dates, um, July 9th is the deadline if you want to provide any comments on the interim final rule. And then uh, the August 31st deadline is only for counties above 250,000 for a performance report, which does not apply to Yuma County. But the, uh, the uh, deadline that applies to us is October 31st, where we have to send, submit our first quarterly project and expenditure report. 
Um, question before you move out of that. Sure. Um, when you're talking about recovery funds must be obligated, you're talking about the first 20 or the 40? Uh, the, it's all 41. So we'll receive, we should have already received the first 21 million, but it hasn't gotten here yet, but we're ready to get it whenever, whenever it comes down. Uh, and then the next half is at least 12 months after that date. So it'll be, let's say, May of this year and then June of, of next year. And that by that time, June of next year, we'll have all 41. You have to obligate it by the end of 2024, and you have to spend it by uh, the end of 2026. 2026. So they should be obligated by, by December 2024. Correct. And uh, basically almost 2025. That's you know one day before 2025, and they should be spent within one, two years of that. Wow. So we've got, um, no, I'm obviously just, I'm we're just trying to, I'm just trying to get to a point where we say, look, I mean, this is, um, you know, this is basically to me, this is going to make budgeting a little tricky because it's one time money. I, I you know, it's, it, we need to keep that in mind. It, it should be set aside for projects we can get done that meet those deadlines, meet those guidelines. And I, you can go on, I can give you to the guidelines. So, um, as I mentioned, they provide guidance on how to uh, apply for the funds. We have already taken care of this. Gil Viegas, Nancy Nye, and I have worked together to make sure that we're um, positioned to receive the funds immediately. Come on. Oh, uh, we've taken care of that as well. And we used ID Me, which is very specific. You have to include a lot of, of personal information to be able to uh, access this portal. Um, again, here is just a one sheet sample of what the allowable uses are for the recovery funds according to Treasury guidance. Again, the devil's all in the details, which comes into play in that interim rule. So um, everything we want to look into, we have to then be sure that it's eligible. And then Treasury does provide individual guidance to you or response to questions. If you have a specific proposed project, they will tell you in advance if it would be acceptable. Now, let me ask you a question on the first one. Support public health response. Can the money be actually used to build anything? I'm going to get into that in the further right. the slides that are further here. Uh, and again, these are not in detail either. So it's not, it may not answer your specific question, but it, it will start to get us there. And we can, we can ask those questions of Treasury as well. So supporting the public health response. Here are the main four categories within the public health response, and there are four overall categories. So public health is the first category, and here are subcategories within the public health response. So um, the, this and the next few slides show the variety of services and programs that counties provide across the country. Many services Yuma does not provide, Yuma County does not provide, or counties within Arizona don't provide, and I'll show you some examples of that. Later, so those wouldn't necessarily apply to us. Addressing negative in economic impacts, that is to the public. That's not to our, gov our uh, re reduced revenue. So addressing economic impacts to workers and families, small businesses, the public sector, if we were hit hard by the economic impacts or impacted industry. Again, it will be important to coordinate with the cities and the town and the tribes to be sure we're not provide duplicating programs or services to reach these groups. If the city's doing something that's going to cover like small businesses, then maybe the county should not do that because we're going to do, we'll end up giving the same businesses money twice, potentially, and we don't want that to happen. We don't want anyone to take advantage of this program, but we want it to, to meet the needs of our community. Have you been coordinating with the city? Um, I'll get into this. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Sorry, Mr. Chair. So equity-focused services. This is where... Um, there is some guidance from the Treasury that relates to census tracts and eligibility for different programs. So this is something that's going to be uh, really um, important to get in, delve into all the details. One item that we have uh, listed here is the housing and neighborhoods, affordable housing development. Of course, this the what I do want to mention is that uh, Nancy and I has informed me that the home consortium has received two and a half million dollars um, federal funds. Federal, yeah, right, federal funds that might be able to be used towards housing. And so 
our funds may our ARPA funds may not necessarily be needed for that, or they could be um, complementary to that. And for instance, educational disparities, high poverty, high poverty school districts. This is another indication of how counties offer different things in different parts of the country, because counties on the East Coast are responsible for school districts, for, for taxing them and providing funding to them, where in, Yuma, in Arizona, school districts are an independent uh, unit of government. So this may not apply to Yuma County. The same with high quality child care and child welfare families. So again, the county is not involved in, in welfare programs. We just give them money. Before, before you leave those four. Yes. We also, the county here has always, almost never, got into affordable housing development that I can remember ever since I've been here. For one reason or another, I think we feel that the community has enough tools to do that. But that is one of the areas that we never really delve into uh, affordable housing, which is a big issue in some of the outlying areas in the middle of town. Anyway, the city of Yuma, the city of Summerton, the city of San Luis, I'm sure we'll take a look at that. Wow. Homelessness. Yeah. So replacing lost revenue. Again, there's a specific definition of lost revenue. Um, <clears throat> two items of interest in this category. First of all, you have to meet the definition of your of lost revenue. And then secondarily, um, as you see in the final bullet point, recipients can use funds to support government services, which include or are not limited, but are not limited to maintenance of, maintenance of infrastructure or pay go spending for building new infrastructure, including roads, which would also include buildings. Oh, and also the next bullet, modernization of cybersecurity, including hardware, software, and protection of critical infrastructure. Those two items are, are on the board's discussion today, I mean, mm -hmm. this month related to the, your budget. So it, it's possible that that could be used for those funds, but if it's under the category of lost revenue and that's the first criteria, we may not be eligible to use it because we haven't, if we can't meet the, and we probably won't meet the definition of lost revenue compared to FY 1819, uh, then I don't know whether we could use this category to pay for buildings mm -hmm. so that it, it, so, it requires more exploration let me just so, put it that way so what you're saying is if we can't show that we lost revenue to cover this project we may not be able to have those projects covered by this fund correct right. right unless we can use a different category that doesn't relate to revenue to do the to do the buildings for instance providing health care which is the first category it, that may be something where we could use funds to uh, contribute toward the health <coughs> building. If we build a new uh, building for health, that mm -hmm. may be a, an eligible um, expense is, for these funds. Is there anything that we could do to solve or at least try to alleviate the PM10 problem as a health problem? I mean, you know, when I look at that, I look, well, look, we have a bunch of, we have a bunch of roads that probably need some, some assistance in terms of keeping the PM10, yeah. you know, particularly in the air. If we could just simply come up with a PM10 yeah. attenuation plan, we may be able to use some of these funds to help us pave some of those roads out there, or at least treat them, yeah. you know. That's a good idea. It, it's, it's certainly a health issue. I mean, it you know, it's. For us, yeah. We could certainly explore that. It's a great idea. What about, to Mr. Chairman, on the environmental remediation, paying off the, uh, the archery range? Mm -hmm. uh, no, there's only a small amount that's, that's still outstanding and will be done, and it's in the budget currently. I didn't know if we could just go ahead and just... It's possible we could replace those funds with these funds, yeah. if that's what you're... And then relieve the general fund of that amount. That's yeah. possible. What about, Mr. Chair, and what about the Tacna water? I really, I That's, bet they are already receiving, we're time. receiving USDA grants for that. I know. Is it a grant, though? It's not a, something they have to pay back? There is, it's mostly grant, but part, partly loan. The yep. part that's not grant that has to be paid back, we could use that, use the funds for that. It's, it's that's very it. possible. It just depends because those are federal funds also, and these are federal funds. So, you would so we would just one of those need matching to, things where we'll, you we'll can't look use into it. Any way we can expand that Tacna water and make it a bigger project? Funds to it. I'm I can't answer because the question. I'd love to see growth out in that huh. direction. Well, and, it, it, it's and kind of a little broad. Water, the discussion. It would be different. It yeah. would 
make okay. a huge difference. So let's, let's see. This was a replace loss revenue one. <laughs> I think we're, we're getting into it. I like the brainstorming though, that's good. So anyway, this outlines the calculation for lost revenue. And as it, it says, you uh, begin with the last full fiscal year prior to the public health emergency, which in our case would be July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019. Yeah, so then we'd have to calculate how did, related to this other cal full, further calculation, do we meet the criteria or not? That's gonna be tough. Uh, and again, the lost revenue is on a continuing basis. So maybe not this year, but maybe next year we have some kind of a of a downturn and we end up having less revenue than we did back in 1819. Then you can continue to calculate it each year. Uh, if you, to the extent you have a reduction, then we could um, use funds for that purpose. Um, here is a real uh, very sticky one <laughs> premium pay for essential employees it's it's a huge amount mm -hmm. uh, but it's not just for county workers it could be any work performed by either the uh, county city state nursing home employees farm workers janitors truck drivers public health and safety staff child care workers social service staff it's etc so it it's very broad and it look it, it could be opening a real can of worms if we go down this Path. Like a PPP, a payment protection plan, where you step in and provide funds for people yeah. who goes directly to the employees, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that we've been hit to that extent throughout our community that that premium pay would be necessary. Mm -hmm. And and as you know, the county provided premium pay for uh, public safety, health, and some uh, superior court mm -hmm. employees earlier, okay. early on. Oh, Probably the, the category that might have the most value or uh, importance to Yuma County. So water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, while the county does not really provide water and sewer except through um, improvement districts, there are two potential projects, besides the ones that you've mentioned uh, today, that th these funds might be able to be used for. That is the housing. Uh, housing department is working with City of Somerton to extend the water line. Uh, to serve housing so that they can get rid of their water plant, their well, and uh, have constant reliable source of water. Um, the housing share, it's its mainly funded through ADEQ, but housing share would be about $200,000. Uh, and then the Greater Yuma Port Authority cost to create developed lots for the remainder of the industrial park in South County uh, that includes water and sewer improvements as, as well as road improvements. So those would be eligible for these for ARPA funds, and that could reduce the need for general fund to provide a loan to the GYPA for the for the water and sewer portion of that development. So those are just a couple of ideas. Um, also, the board has expressed strong interest in accessible and reliable broadband service to underserved and unserved areas of Yuma County, and the ARPA funds provide uh, must include a re requirement that service be a minimum of a hundred. M MBP. MBPS. <laughs> uh, download and 100 upload, which we do not have here in Yuma County. So that would be a very valuable project uh, for us to pursue. And they, <clears throat> the broadband task force is um, continuing to work, and we're going to later this week identify <clears throat> the RFP that we'd like to, to use as a sample to uh, issue our, an RFP for Yuma County. So um, ineligible expenses, we uh, pension funds, that's not a need that we have since Yuma County was very <clears throat> proactive in using pension bonds to pay off our unfunded liability. So that's not, a not needed by us and it's also ineligible. <clears throat> and um, they also have some specific requirements on states related to ineligible expenses. So I also talked about the rep reporting requirements earlier. Again, our first plan is due August 31st, 2021. And as I said, this was NACO. So NACO has a uh, COVID clearinghouse if you want to go to NACO.org for more information. And uh, as I mentioned, the devil is in the details. So we'll be delving into the interim rule as well as the FAQs. And I'll send that out to you because it could spur uh, your thoughts about additional projects that you might want us to consider for these funds. All right, um, and, and I guess our first step should be to see what falls within the scope. You know, I mean, we may think of many projects, but 
only those that fall within the scope of what's approved or kind of approved that need approval basically from the treasury we should start you know coming up with a list of those that qualify and you know so we don't spend a lot of time talking about doing something that really won't fall within the parameters of what the treasury wants so if we start by sort of listing the ones, we'll begin with broadband and then move on to some of the projects like the well, the, the Tacna, or, you know, those type of things. And then, then we'll start discussing the pros and cons of doing that within the next, I mean, it's, it's not like an emergency situation, but it, it's something that I know takes time. Uh, and, and we're gonna be talking about buildings and everything. I mean, we're gonna be talking about other things that I'm sure uh, are going to have a bearing on what's left to do. Um, so, you know, I think that this was a good start. You know, it allows us to see the possibilities and now we have to get from possibilities to something that can be done. And like I said, I think the broadband one's an easy one. Water and sewer projects are easy ones because you can, you know, you can come up with solid projects. Um, a lot of it is also going to depend on having projects that you can actually do in a relatively short period of time because you need to, you need to make sure that in other words, it's really difficult for me to see how we can invent something. It's easier for me to see projects that we already have. Uh, and maybe that EPA PM10 thing is something that, you know, we could start working on as a, as a plan to deal with that. And, and it may involve, you know, treating a few roads out in the county or, you know, paving a few roads out in the county that are creating a lot of the PM10. There are going to be issues that we can't deal with. Um, in terms of you know uh, our inability to control them, like the freeway traffic, I mean that's just not going to be it. But in terms of dust, we may be able to do something. Uh, I don't know, maybe even with farmers at some particular point in time to coordinate when they burn those kind of things. You know, in other words, have a PM10 plan and then see what funds it will take to run it for three or four years. Okay, uh, any other questions, guys? I mean, this was a preliminary, just letting you know that, that we've got those rules and that we'll be looking at some of those projects in a much more direct way, uh, relatively soon. Okay, uh, anything else, Mr. President? No? All right, we're gonna go on to discussion and action by the Board of Supervisors regarding the use of funds to pay existing debt or use cash to reduce future debt issuance. That would be a, a PowerPoint presentation and I suppose Hill is gonna, is it Hill? Gilberto. <laughs> uh, while Gil's coming up to the front, this is again another budget item that you've been in discussions with on the on the recommended budget, and so we'll bring this back and have you officially take action at the um, on June seventh for the tentative budget. But we definitely would like to. Um, Supervisor Porches has asked to have kind of a work session setting to talk about those options of either paying off existing debt or using cash to pay down any future debt for any buildings, that kind of thing. So hey, uh, we're here to have that discussion with you and so to make sure that you weigh in on what your preferences are and ask as many questions as you'd like so uh, you can make an informed decision. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Gil Villegas, Chief Financial Officer. What I have put together, it's a spreadsheet, some of you have already seen this, on the current outstanding debt that we have for the journal fund. We're trying to open the spreadsheet, there you go. You can enlarge that a little bit, please. Working on it. Is that in our packet? No, it isn't, is it? That, that's not in our packet, is it? Not in your packet, so no. what I did, I created Thank additional you. copies. Because I thought I, I didn't see anything in there. I looked. Mm -hmm. Thanks, So like Susan said, um, we've been discussing this topic, this item about uh, the option of us paying whatever is due right now in long-term debt uh, in order for us to save some interest, or if we could apply that money towards uh, reduction of issuing new debt since we're gonna have a need for a new building in the future, at least those are the discussions that we had in the budget process. So this spreadsheet, what, what it does, it lists all the outstanding, how much we have paid, if it was callable, or, which means if we can pay it early or not. And the first three, three items that you'll see in your spreadsheet uh, for fiscal year 2013, 17, 18, those are the bond issues, the most recent bond issues that we have done. 
Uh, the interest rate is listed right there next to it, 3%, 2.37, and 3.01%. Where I want you to concentrate is on column M, which is principal 630-2021. At the end of the fiscal year, after we do our required payment for a current fiscal year, that's how much is going to be outstanding. Also, column P tell us how much interest we're going to be paying, uh, outstanding interest, 630-2021, how much is due, the additional payments that we have to make for those three items. Item number four, it's an IGA, intergovernmental agreement that we have with housing, where we are required to pay $290,000. There is no interest. We're just making payments back. So there is no interest for that one. And of course, the most recent issuance step in 2020, that's for the PSPRS and Corp, which is not callable. The way we structure the debt, we have to wait until July 2019. So the first five items are long-term debt that we have. The last three items in the bottom capital leases as well. The first lease was for the uh, recorder's equipment, 3.66%. Uh, the second one, 2018, is for the vehicles that we have for the sheriff and the assessors. And the last one is for the uh, cameras, body cameras for the sheriff's office. Same columns, principal, you will see the money that we owe and the interest that we owe as well. Bottom line, if I can draw your attention to the uh, amount, 10893 can you scroll down a little bit? That would be the investment that we have to make for those that qualify to be pay, pay early. If we make that investment, if we pay those debts right now, we'll be saving $1.6 million. Mm -hmm. That's the total on it. So that information I wanted to provide it to you guys just for additional discussion. I have created some scenarios. I don't know if uh, we want to go over them, but Susan, if you have any additional thing you want me to do or show them. Sure, we'll provide the line. You know, I was a little bit, uh, well, this headline that we had in the newspaper, I had a lot of phone calls regarding our tax rate. I know it doesn't necessarily apply specifically to this, but we've been levied the same with evaluations going up at a 6.1. Have you put the calculations in there, what it would do to uh, keep the tax the same so that we're not raising people's tax because the average is like 90% roughly in the county? that they didn't see an increase mm -hmm. because of the valuations? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, supervised lines, um, the 6.1% increase in assessed value, that you have to consider that out, that also includes new construction on it. So yes, the assessed valuation, according to the assessors, is increasing. If your property sees an increase in assessed value, because we're keeping the same rate, right. we're not increasing the rate, there is a possibility that you will see an increase on your on your taxes. Well, what can we do to make sure the taxes don't go up? Uh, well, it... <laughs> Have we looked at any forecasts there? Go ahead. So this topic is completely separate from sure, the understand. entire the budget, the way it's structured right now, which includes the current tax rate. The board can discuss, the, uh, can discuss, especially on June 7th, we want you to discuss and make a determination if you want to change okay. the tax rate. Um, if you do, if you lower the tax rate, then you'll need to cut something out of the budget. That's on an that's an ongoing expense because the on you'll be cutting an ongoing. Let me, let me revenue. see if I can get a little bit into that because I I know that there is a, a tendency to look at these things when they're good and to say okay let's try to isolate people from the impact of of, of an evaluation increase. The problem is we don't know if you know someone's property is going to go up in value or not. You know that's the problem. The problem is some properties are not going to go up. They're going to stay at the same value. So if you cut the rate, you cut it for everybody. That means in some cases you're going to be lowering the tax rate. In some cases, to try to keep it, to try to keep to insulate people from that, you sometimes have to, you know, if you lower the tax rate, that impacts it going forward. It doesn't matter. It, it impacts forever. It's not just one year. That's one of the things that I try to emphasize when we're working through the budget, the recurring nature of some costs and the one-time expenses. So when you have one-time money, like we do right now, you know, that's why people react to that, because they see this additional revenue that they want to all earn something. I don't have a problem with one-time expenses. I really don't. I think this is the time. I just have a problem with recurring changes, because what happens is once you make that decision, then you pass the buck on to the next one, to the next, you know, board. 
And we, we have secured a 10 year, uh, and, I, and I think we can do that. We can discuss that. We can discuss the reduction of trans rates as long as we know what we're doing and, and understand the impact that it has over 10 years, because that's why we bought that, you know, that program, that software program, to be able to tell our board members, look, when you do a, you make a decision to reduce or increase the tax rate, you're actually doing it over a long time. So I, I caution everybody to take a look at this situation, and I, I can see it from that perspective, because I've, I've gotten those, those calls about, well, what are you guys gonna do? You have a lot of money. But it, what needs to be understood is the nature of those changes. If you change the tax rate, you're changing it for everybody. And, and you're trying to do this to isolate some, some residents out there or some from the impact of an increase in evaluation of the property. But you must realize that an increase in evaluation of the property is going to increase the value of the property at the same time that it increases you know, your taxes that you pay. So what we'll end up doing in some ways, and we'll get into this discussion at length, what you end up doing is you end up making it so that people who own a bigger house and own a better house gets a break, while the other ones that don't have any change in the property tax rates also get a break, but it's a much smaller one. And I think I already see Bill kind of raising up a little bit, because I think we're getting into a lot of lengthy discussion. Why don't you do this? Sure. Yeah. For, Jan for June the 7th, when we have a discussion, let's bring these issues up mm -hmm. and let's talk about them and let's have a little more information about them. And like what would it be, what the impact would be, how long it would be, those kind of things. I think we haven't raised the tax rate in five years. Uh, we haven't increased it, we haven't lowered it. We have balanced it over the last 10 years. And I think you can bring that history back. And, and as a person that has been here in good times and bad times, I'll tell you, in good times you have this increasing pressure to make some change, but we have to take a look at it long-term. So let's go back to um, this issue, which is whether we decide to pay off debt or whether we decide to save the money for uh, future building uh, needs. Is that Mr. what Chairman, we're talking about? Yeah. I would recommend too, if we can, uh, let's put out a press release or something to let, help the public understand a little bit more, you know, as far as. Yeah, yeah. this statement, this, this increase. Yeah, like this problem. statement is very yeah. misleading. And, and, you know, that, and, and, but I think that that's a nation, that statement is sort of like common right now. California has got hundreds of billions of dollars to do in, they're all trying to adapt to this. It's been, it's it's really injecting a lot of money into this, the communities, but at the same time, it's injecting a lot of uncertainty over long, long term because we're dealing with budgets that are not gonna be normal. But let's go back to this. So are you telling us then, okay, you guys need to make a decision. Do you save the money for future, you know, building needs or do you use it to pay off debt? That is the question in front of us. And what you've given us is, the, is what is outstanding in terms of debt. And what you're telling us is, okay, you already know what's coming, right? Uh, meaning we have to do, we have to, we, no, we don't have to. <laughs> we, we're looking into uh, building an administrative building. We're looking into building a, 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 some, some sort of accommodation for the IT department and the public works department. Is that what we're talking about? No, not the public works. What was it? IT and what? Oh, and the more, and the facilities management and public fiduciary. Facilities management and public fiduciary. So, um, I, I, I personally, I personally prefer to pay off debt. I think that what we've got in front of us with the construction phase is that we don't know when that construction phase is going to start. It could be six months, it could be a year, it could be a year and a half, it could be two years. I've been around uh, for 22 years and I still haven't seen an administrative building built. We've done everything else. So to me, uh, the savings that you effectuate if you pay off debt are immediate. You start not paying, you know, in other words, you start saving money right away. Uh, you don't pay, you can build up your fund, you can do a lot of things. If you wait to pay off, uh, to pay off a future building that you don't know when you're gonna start building, you will have this money, but it will, you will still be making interest payments, even if they're low interest payments. Uh, I understand the lack of knowledge about what would happen if we went out and issued bonds to build later on because the interest rate may go up and the way the market is right now, it's crazy. And it could be that instead of paying 3% for the new, Construction, we'd be paying 4% or 4.5%. I do understand that, but it's the burden of hand theory for me. Yes, Mr. Chairman, and, and let me walk through these scenarios that I created. Once again, I appreciate the information, and it's a lot of speculation, like you said, in the market right now. Uh, interest going up, going down. There has been a lot of infusion of cash in the current market from the federal government. So interest rate are staying semi-low, but... Uh, we all have to understand that these revenues are not sustainable, even not even for us in Yuma County. 
So that's something that we need to consider in the future. So what I have done here, I assembled something like, again, for discussion purposes, let's say that we have that, those 18.9, 18.8 million dollars. Uh, scenario number one, which is the one that I'm highlighting right now, if we were to invest that money in a long-term debt service, that would be the savings that we have in interest, $1.6 million. At the same time, because we have a need, and I'm just considering the uh, building, uh, the administration building, $30 million plus cost of issuance, we have a need to issue a debt, which if we consider a 20-year term, a 2.75% interest rate on a regular amortization rate, We'll be paying a total of interest of $9.5 million. Once we reduce the 1.6 immediate savings that we will have, but well, we're still looking into a total estimated $7.9 million. Now, correlation with that same scenario number four, let's say that we don't pay the current debt, that we go ahead and we put that money towards our principal and cost of issuance for the infrastructure, which is gonna reduce the principal that we're gonna have. Same terms, same percentage, total interest to be calculated, 7.7. .7. So we, there would be a estimated savings of $217,000. When? when would that happen? That is key. I'm talking throughout the completion of the debt service, which is 20 years right now at the term. That how much money you're gonna be saving when you pay that complete that, that, that loan. Your, your, your scenario doesn't, take into account, it may take 12 months before we begin that construction phase. See, that, that's what I'm talking about. I, I understand that there will be an overall saving over 20 years at a lower interest rate. Right. The problem is you need to save this money for another year, or year and a half before you have construction. So what's the point here? The point is, if you pay debt, you save right away. If you wait 12 months, you, might, you may save a million dollars over 20 years, but you're also gonna lose them uh, you know, over the next 12. So it's just a matter of deciding when it's more convenient and when do you save money. Now, as a former, um, no, not a former, as a supervisor been around a long time, I can tell you right now that one of the things we can't do is predict the future. We can't. I mean, I can tell you right now, as I've said before, that I've been waiting 20 years to see an administrative building. Now, I don't know, if, and for those people who follow that, that retention basin that I don't remember what it's called anymore, yeah, it's my part. They've been waiting like 11 years to, you know, or 12, 20 to build that up. So what I'm saying is, look, it's a bird in the hand. You pay off the debt. You don't have any. When you need to float, you don't, we don't even know if that's going to be a $30 million project. Mm -hmm. We could use portions of that money to build the infrastructure for the IT. I saw cybersecurity. We may be able to use some of those funds that are coming in from the federal government to build the cybersecurity cyber building, the IT building. Uh, we could use a few million dollars out of that. So there is nothing that tells us that it's going to be $30 million. That's what's estimated right now. But what we can tell is what, how much money we're going to save if you pay it off. That's my take on it. Mm -hmm. I know somebody else could have a different take, and I understand that. And I understand, Gil, that as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a financial planner, you're planning, you're planning to look at the future. It was the best option for us. In addition, not only to the interest, also, we always consider the amount of money that we're going to issue and the financial tool that we're going to use. Most of the time, it's a lot more easier for us to issue debt of a lower amount with better terms, easier financial tool. Instead of uh, doing a general, uh, general obligation bond, we can do a, a bank qualified, things like that. So I, I just want to make sure that you have all the information. Yeah. What, the 217, is that, that's the savings? For the 20 years or, or, or three years? For the 20 years. At the end of the, the project, when we pay off the debt, the 20 years, uh, we will be comparing that if we pay right now or if we don't pay right now the debt, if we don't pay it, it will be less interest that we're going to be paying. So we'll be saving 217 at the end of the bond issuance into 20 years. That's not, much That's not very much. That's not very much. No, wait a minute. Once again, no. the, Supervisor's portions. This is just at a two and three quarters uh, uh, percent interest rate. So we have scenarios as well. What about if it goes up to three or three, three and a quarter? I, I'm in the presumption that we will have this going on probably fairly quickly for the next fiscal year. So oscillating around three or three and a quarter percent interest. So now we're talking 
a little more than half a million dollars. So we're talking almost a million dollars if the interest are up to three and a quarter. So optimistic, a little more realistic. And worst case. Worst Either case way scenario. You're money. Either way, you're saving money by reducing the amount of uh, principal that you're going to issue. Disposal for financing the new debt, 20 million roughly, are a lot easier than going after a 30 million, right? Uh, that would be a fair estimate, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, my experience is it doesn't work that way. My experience is a smaller, <laughs> a smaller, you know, debt actually doesn't pay. It's what it's bigger than that pays. It takes about the same amount of legal, takes about the same amount of, of, of work to pass a $3 million bond as it takes to pass a $30 million bond sometimes. So to me, it's again, a choice between doing something now that we know what the outcome will be and waiting until later to find out what that outcome will be. That's to me, we're gonna save anyway, from my perspective, but we don't know is when. And to me, knowing what you're gonna to save today or tomorrow or next month, is a lot better than planning future maybe saving. It could be that the interest rate is lower than it is right now. It's also another thing that can happen. So, <laughs> because you don't know what will happen, you're just estimating and that's fine. And what I'm saying is, okay, we do have a certain amount of money left over. Holding it in the bank doesn't, it happens to be what this happens. You know, and you look like you're so, you know, rich that all of a sudden everybody starts thinking, well, they don't need any help. They're pretty flush. Richard. So to me, I, I just, I, to me, it's not even, you know. The immediate, immediate catch, yeah. Mr. Chair and sure. Jill, when, um, when are these others paid off? How, how long do we have till they pay off? Because some of them, I don't think we have much longer to pay off. 2029? So for the uh, issuance in, 20, in 17, these are our terms. Mm -hmm. It's due on June 27th, June 28th, June 29th, and of course the latest one, July 35. So oh, okay. yes, we have already invested a lot of interest paid on those debt issuance. Now we're paying down the principal, right? That is correct. Usually that's how it works. With the capital leases, 24, August 22, and July 25. I don't think the, I don't think the leases are big enough. To leave. And plus, they're not even, some of them are not even. In, in essence, the way the contract is written for those that lease the body cameras, we're not paying any interest. So, yeah, just qualify that one. I wouldn't include those on, on the debt service. If we take out, Mr. Chairman, if we take out the, the two 0% interest ones and leave them alone, since it's not costing us anything to pay on them, and even leave maybe the 1.86, I mean, you're talking a million dollars. But Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Simons, that's what I did on that spreadsheet towards the bottom. That's how I arrived at the 10 million 893. That's what it, it would. I, I took uh, out from the, okay, I see the, the okay, total principal that we owe, $36.3 million. Mm -hmm. I took out what is not callable, which is the, uh, the uh, PSPRS. And then I also reduced the, the ones with the zero interest housing and the uh, body camera. So that's how I arrived to the 10 million 893. So it would take 10,893,791 wow. to, to pay for Yes, 10 million. Right. Um, I, can, I can see the benefits of not having to go out for so much, such a large amount. I mean, yeah. look, we went out for $25 million for the pension plan. Uh, that worked out decently well, but you know, again, I, I, don't, I don't think we can lose. It's just a matter of deciding, you know, when. I want to clarify on the 2020, this is just the journal fund portion. We also have the core portion, which is assigned to the jail district. Mm -hmm. The total issue was around $35 million. Yeah. yeah, I remember building that one. And I remember how much money we paid to get that one built. But again, guys, I mean, this is one of those choices where you can't lose. Uh, you know, you just need to make a decision. So we'd like to hear from everyone kind of what, any more, any additional questions, any, you know, your thoughts or what, which preferences will bring it officially, you'll act on June 7th, but we'd like to be prepared for, you know, what direction you would like to go. Mr. Chairman, yeah. aside from this discussion, because it's centered around the money that we would spend on a new building, I'm just generally concerned as you are aware of the rising cost of construction. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem to be an end in sight. I'm just wondering about the prudence of moving towards that new building right now, although it's long overdue. Uh, for example, uh, for example, just talking with a couple of people over the weekend, their initial bids on their homes were like 
for the rubber package, it's like 39,000. Now yeah. we're looking at 139,000. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, looking at the steel costs today um, oh my and concrete costs today, it, it's significant. We're looking at over 125% increase in a lot of our costs. costs. And I just don't know that we can commit. Most contractors are not giving a quote that goes beyond five days right now. Um, I know. And it's, uh, I, I would be remiss if we didn't have that discussion. It's a very frank discussion about committing to build a new building um, and then getting uh, engaged. We would have to pre-purchase material in order to guarantee costs. Right. As, a, as a builder, and you know, Jonathan, uh, Supervisor Lyons is a builder, as a builder of sort, uh, I can tell you right now that nothing we can do today is going to speed up that process at all. That takes six months to 12 months at least. And I don't know where we'll be at six months, 12 months, but I can tell you right, right now, that decision to go out to bid, you know, it's the last decision we make on that building. So to me, not beginning, it's the same thing as, you know, dropping everything we've done so far. So I do understand the concerns. I had a $3 million deficit on a $18 million project already. So I know what that feels like. Uh, I also know what it feels like to keep postponing everything. It doesn't help. It just seems to postpone everything and it costs more. We started with the project that was $5 million. We're now at $30 million. Uh, I don't think if we wait another year, it's going to be less. I just think it's going to be further down the road another year. The construction cost, we have no way of knowing when that's going to, if it ever, it's going to go back a little bit to more normal. We expect that to be in the construction field, but I would caution against against moving moving the projects back and back and back when the project's not ready yet. We're, we're just basically talking about what we're going to be able to do. So the concern about how much it's going to cost is a good concern, but I think it's probably more appropriate when we know you know, when we have a better sense, if the, if it comes back as very high, yes. then I think we can back off and say, look, there we're you not going to do it. Can just don't do want that? every, I, I don't want to postpone the planning process mm -hmm. while we while we wait for the construction situation to get better. That and it may not get better. It may not get better. Mr. Chair, that was going to be my question. This just, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. You were going to say something. What, Gil? Jonathan. Uh, three. No, three. I want to. Yes, well, this is just considering the one administration building, but within the uh, the budget, we're talking about three buildings. Right. And we're talking about the health department. Health department. We do, and we're talking about the IT, and more facilities, and everything. Well, not the mortuary, it's the whatever, fiduciary. fiduciary. Yeah, well, look, again, this was not, the discussion <clears throat> here in front of us was, okay, do we, do we go ahead and use the money that we built up to pay down debt, or do we save it? In, in, in hopes that in the future we could use that to lower our commitment in terms of a bond issuance and maybe get better rates uh, or not. Wouldn't you we know, get better rates if we had less debt? That's up to Sarah. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor uh, Pancrasi, yes, that definitely helps. Um, but right now, uh, Yuma County has a very, very good rate, double A plus, very close to triple A, which is just for the Treasury. So I, our current situation with less debt, I don't see that much of an improvement. Yeah, that much of a difference. So, so everybody think about it. And when we come back yeah. on the, on June the seventh, you know, you need or even before then, yeah. just let <clears throat> let us know what you're gonna do with that because I don't think it changes the budget. It just changes the way we're gonna spend the money. Mr. Chair, my, my question well, would be, oh, no, no. Yeah. what is it that you recommend? Um, <laughs> Supervisor Porches, I, as financial officer, I just provide the information. I want, I want to make sure that the Board of Supervisors makes... Yeah, a yeah that was a good one. That is a good one. Sure, because we're having like this position. discussion because you suggested that this was a better way. So, <laughs> you know... No, I, I mean, I, I just want to... I mean, we, yeah, we sit here, saying, we, you know, some of us... Or, or we, we don't even know what we're talking about when we talk about construction, but I mean, we don't see the numbers like you do every day. And, and, you know. Supervised, supervised supporters, and, and I think I already alluded to it as a financial guy, we always look in the future. Yeah, so I, I prefer to less issuance in the future. All right, okay. Any other questions? Yeah, supervisor uh, Mr. Chair and, and Gil, can we do the planning and then not follow through? I mean, like, if we do the planning and then we find out that the costs are so excessive well, that... Well, no, that's, 
then money is still going to be there. So the money, the, mo the money is uh, this decision really is about how to use the money or not use the money. It's not about changing the budget. The budget is the same. It doesn't know, matter. We can go forth and decide to change our minds along the way. Okay, that's, that's, what not, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, including the building. Uh, in including well, building right. anything, correct. Given the I'm current conditions that, of construction, uh, I'm looking at that that uh, uh, chart on Jonathan's. Um... So don't look at that chart. Look it over. Turn it over the other way, D, like that, and it no. goes down. It goes those down. those <laughs> numbers are way up there, yeah, man. Well, but it, wait, we're all looking. Everybody's in construction is really worried about you know this this incredible large yes. increases. But again, I don't think that at this particular time we're discussing the buildings. We're discussing what to do with these funds Correct. that are there. It's either to use them to pay down debt or to wait and see if it can help us uh, if we need to, if we ever go sure. on the building, sure. you know, if we need yeah. them to use some debt. And, you know, I think, I think I can do it for you, Gil. Your recommendation would be that we wait, that we see what the situation is before we spend the money out and see if, if there's a change in the nature of the market and so on and so forth. That's, that's what's called, to me, that's what's called investing. <laughs> it was a risky preposition because as, as Jonathan, uh, Supervisor Lyons already mentioned, the longer we waited in the construction field, the worse it's gotten. And we all expect that to break sometime, but we don't know that. We don't. we don't know that. And I think it's the same way with the financial markets. You sort of have what you have right now, and you don't know what you're going to get in six months from now, because this is a very different, these are different times. It could be that these funds that the treasury is making available will keep a lid on this market, or it could be just going off the, you know, whatever we don't know, in five months or six months. It's difficult. That's why I always say, you get a bird in the hand, you know, but... Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just uh, one last thing. Because of that which volatility that we have in the market, because of all the uncertainty, that's one of the reasons why I prefer to issue less money in the future than, than more. Okay, got it. Uh, is that it? So we can move on to the next one. Gil, thank you very much. It was a good presentation. Susan, if, when you start laughing, you know, you may you want to make a comment. Right, yeah, it's like a box of chocolates. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to get. All right. <laughs> Step aside from the podium. All right, where were we? Oh, we were, yeah, he runs off quickly. Ian, you're next. Uh, so this is discussion and possible action. You know, we're going to have the economic development person come up and give us a report every once in a while. So don't think, Alex, you're going to be, you know, sitting there for a long time. Look at Ian. He, he also thought he was going to be sitting there. Uh, go ahead, Ian. Members of the board, Ian Administrator. Provides an update on a few items. This will likely be my last mm -hmm. legislative update uh, as Mr. Figueroa will be taking the reins <laughs> moving forward. Yeah, I'm missing <coughs> You don't need that. <laughs> okay, uh, last week, once again, another slow week at the state capitol with very minimal action. The County Supervisors Association reports no formal progress on the proposed tax package or budget as legislators continue to work behind the scenes to come to an agreement. Negotiations are continuing on substantial tax reform, including the potential adoption of a flat rate income tax and reduction of the commercial assessment ratio. Discussions appear to center on how big of a tax cut to provide, how quickly it'll take effect, and what impact it'll have on various entities, including municipalities and counties. CSA has been working with Representative Tim Dunn with the uh, potential proposal um, to go to leadership for a flat $500,000 to all but the largest three counties as an offset for revenue loss due to the commercial assessment ratio reduction. Mm -hmm. You'll recall that in Yuma County, which you can see at the bottom left, um, the estimated impact of the ratio reduction is an ongoing $775,000 a year. Uh, as we look toward the end of the session, uh, while predictions from legislators on when their work will be complete range from wrapping up this week or next week or to sometime next month, CSA is expecting a push to adjourn by Memorial Day weekend. Can you, before you go, can you back up a little bit and let me, let me see if, if the board, because we've been doing this for, for a few years, and before we did the flat, you know, the rate, the tax rate, we used to do levy. We used to use the levy as a basis for our, our rate, and it used to change based on the levy. So the levy meant to us that once we figure out how much money we needed, then we set the tax rate to fit that. 
that was a very, very treacherous situation as far as I was concerned because it meant that during good times, you, you, know, you lower the tax rate. During bad times, you raise the tax rate. Well, when it was bad, it was really bad. Mm -hmm. And we had to raise it quite a bit to catch up. And that's why I always say to, pe to, to anybody that listens, you have, to be, you have to have a steady hand and not take it when it's good because when it's bad, you have to make it up. And when you make it up, then you have to face the voters and tell them, well, instead of a 0 0.04, we're going to have to increase it by 0 0.15 or 0.17. And it gets really dicey. It is always my, my conservative position, because I call it a conservative financial position, is to try to stay steady through these ups and downs as much as possible. When I see, when I see a reduction in the uh, com uh, commercial rate, I always think what impact is going to have if we have to raise the residential rate to, to compensate. And I think that's what, you know, I, I, I get calls on saying, are you going to raise the residential rate? Well, not necessarily, but you don't solve a reduction by having another reduction. You actually make it worse. Mm -hmm. You need to take it easy, take your time. And, you know, we don't know what the impact is going to be because you brought that levy uh, statement on it. I figured it was time to, to start separating the difference between a levy-based tax rate and a tax rate, a tax rate that basically stays steady throughout time. Right. Okay, I do want to hit on just uh, three bills very quickly. HB 2040 is the new name of the bill that would prohibit counties from requiring an applicant for a land division to conduct a survey as a condition of approving the land division or conveyance issuing of a building permit. While CSA says it's successfully being held up in committee of the whole, there are fears that this bill will make its way into the budget, at which point it'd be very difficult to stop. HB 2551 allows a person who possesses a valid concealed carry permit to bring their weapon into a public establishment or event unless the public place or event establishes a, a uh, secured facility. However, the state is seeing the significant financial impact of implementing this bill, just as counties have been expressing, and CSA says this one may not make it through the budget process. And the last bill I want to mention, <coughs> HB 2570, would prohibit state agencies, counties, and municipalities from revoking business licenses of businesses not complying with the governor's executive order issued during a pandemic or epidemic. Unless the agency, county, or municipality can provide convincing evidence that the business caused the transmission of the disease. This bill has been sent to the governor for his signature. CSA has submitted a veto request, as they say this bill reduces the county's ability to address issues with businesses that are not complying with public health and safety requirements. Governor Doug Ducey announced his Arizona Back to Work plan last week, under which Arizona will no longer be taking the federal pandemic unemployment compensation and instead will offer one-time bonuses to returning workers, along with child care, child care support, educational opportunities, and rental assistance. Many employers, including here in Yuma County, have reported having trouble competing with the federal government's unemployment payments, mm -hmm. which in some cases paid more than an actual job would. The governor's program takes effect July 10th and will offer a $2,000 back to work bonus for eligible workers through Labor Day. The drought continues. Last week, Arizona's Department of Forestry and Fire Management announced that they have implemented stage one fire restrictions on all state owned land within 10 counties, and that includes Yuma County. The restrictions include prohibitions on outdoor fire usage smoking, discharge of firearm or fireworks, among other limitations. If dry conditions continue, the agency could prohibit campfires outside of developed campsites or close public access to state-owned land or managed lands altogether. And of course, you just had a discussion on the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, there could be a couple of other big federal programs coming down the pike. President Biden seized upon April's lower than expected job growth to argue that his $2.3 trillion jobs and infrastructure bill and uh, his $1.8 trillion family support bill are now needed more than ever. The American Jobs Plan uh, would focus on rebuilding the nation's transportation infrastructure, which the president says would create millions of jobs. And the American Families Plan, meanwhile, would fund universal pre-kindergarten, offer free community college and subsidize child care, among other proposals. The president intends to fund these packages by increasing the corporate tax rate and by raising ta taxes on the very rich. 
Republicans in Congress have said that raising taxes is a line they will not cross. And that is my report. If you have any questions, Alejandro will be happy to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> one at a time. One at a time. So, Supervisor Porches. I, you know, uh, Susan, I, I just want to uh, know if we have, just in case a uh, infrastructure bill comes down the road, and I know sometimes it comes with a tail end of a project, project ready, yeah, project a shovel ready, ready project. Mm -hmm. uh, that do we have some, or are we working on some that we say, yeah, five years. you know, no, it's not a five year. It's got to be. They got to be ready within. Yeah, if right. this um, is not a five year plan, think, if they're gonna be shovel ready, that we've been working on them, just mm -hmm. at least the, all the engineering, it's done, and uh, the 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 plans are done. I mean. Just that we don't, they're on the shelf just waiting for the money to come in, basically. There should be we several CIPs that are. Yeah, I was going to say that. But mm -hmm. I, I can tell you this right now, guys. The, the 2.3 plan, it's a 10 year plan. Normally, when the, the House passes an infrastructure bill, it is not a next year bill, it's a 10 year bill, um, normally, in, under normal circumstances. And this is not just this one, it's not in particular just a transportation, water, or sewer bill. This one's got a bunch of stuff in it. The stuff that in the past we would have never considered to be infrastructure. So one of the things that we need to do is probably get a little more acquainted with what the bill looks like, because I don't, I don't, I think that, uh, um, uh, what do you call them? Not recovery, but incentive. Those bills that are there to incentivize the economy are those ones that requires project ready uh, type things like shovel ready things. Mm -hmm. This one I think is going to be a 10-year infrastructure bill, it, it, it's better for us to have a bunch of projects that are ready to go in case it's one of those situations where there's a lot of money, like in the beginning, and you have to use it on something that's ready. That to me means that we as a county need to start putting together something that is akin to a list of projects that can be done within 12 months, for example, or you know, six months to 12 months, and move those CIPs, have a different CIP, uh, you know, that basically deals with what what would we do or where could we go if we had this much money available? Uh, it's better to be ready if this happens to be one of those uh, bills that require, I mean, uh, provides money right away. Uh, but I think that we need to start looking at our CIP and start moving some things up a little bit. And remember, we work on a budget. So we can't just simply put stuff in the budget that we're not ready to fund, and we don't know what the fund is going to be. So we're going to be, we're going to be sort of walking a thin, you know, very gray line about what is a project ready and when it's not. But one of the things I'd suggest is that we shouldn't be behind the eight ball. We should be uh, looking at again anything we can do through the APA PM10 thing, mm -hmm. and you know anything we can do to water and sewer infrastructure that is ready to go, and obviously roads, which are pretty much. Um, a big issue for us out in the outlaying areas. Yeah. So getting ready, it's a good idea, no matter what, no matter if the, if the money comes in and says you got to use them now, or if it comes in and say you got to use them in five years or two or three mm -hmm. years, good idea. I don't know, it took a long time to say that, right? I could have just said well, it's a good idea. And, and like you're saying, we need to look at stuff. I was uh, sitting there looking at a news article. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw it, the I-40 bridge over the Mississippi and Memphis. They found a crack in the infrastructure and totally shut it down and they don't know how long until they fix it you know so you're talking a major artery so yeah, one thing going to affect her you know i've driven that high, that bridge in highway 95 i mean that you know and i remember when it flooded the other one the, the one that was further down the road and there was water on top of it yeah. years ago yeah so anyway uh it's a good idea to start looking at some of those projects we can move up even if we don't put them in the budget they're ready to go if need be if money comes over and but i gotta remind everybody we work on a budget if it is not in the budget we may not be able to do it mm -hmm. you know that's the problem with well it's a problem man what we're dealing with here that's why the budget and i want to make this a public statement that's why the budget looks like a big budget because we don't know if the revenues are going to be there, but if they're there, we need to have them in the budget. That's why you had a 58% increase in the budget. It's because we don't know what this year, you know, 21, 22 is going to look like. But the worst thing we could have is a situation where we didn't have a budget and we got this funds, so we couldn't use them. So we like to let the public know this is a budget. It's not written on stone. It can be changed. It can be reduced. 
it can, you know, changes can be made along the way. The only change we can make is increase the budget. Well, once we approve it, once we approve the tentative budget, we can increase it. So it's one of those budgets that we throw everything but the kitchen sink at and hope some of these things will turn out okay. But it's not as if we set aside, set our ways into spending 400, I don't remember, 58 million dollars or whatever that was. But that's, that's where we need to get that's right. the word out to the public. Yeah, that that's why I said, let's get the word out to the public. It is a budget. It is not set on stone. It is not really like we know what we're going to be able to deal with. As a matter of fact, most of the day today we've been mm -hmm. discussing uh, those kind of issues. Uh, how do we deal with, you know, it's kind of weird, but how do we deal with this extra fund? Uh, we, I, I'm not familiar with that, uh, but you know, it's the kind of year we've had last year and this year. So anything else, um, Ian? No, Mr. Chairman, uh, maybe, well, the only other thing I might mention is um, we had discussed potentially having another legislative discussion with our six state legislators. The last one we had was April 23rd. As you know, there's been limited action other than uh, just some, some work on the budget at the state. I wasn't sure if you wanted to have one sooner than later or kind of wait and see. But it would be more like what their agenda looks like. I think we're having, I think, I mean, Representative Dunn is having meetings at 2 p.m. with most of these people. So it may be that we're duplicating it. I don't know if the rest of the uh, uh, legislators are available or free. They may be working that Friday, considering the fact that they're coming so close to, you know, the end of the legislative session. So thing you would do is contact them and see what their the schedule looks like. Last time we couldn't get most of them into in, in on, on on the phone, and it was probably because they're really busy at the end of that. They're coming up at the end of the session, so they are probably busy. And you know, when they work through the night, if they happen to work through the night, it's going to be difficult for us to get them together. Um, I think that what we need to do is, if you're aware of something that you want them to know, just contact them directly as, as soon as possible. I think that the meetings work well when we had issues that we could talk to them about. The issues that right now are pretty much up on our radar are mostly uh, financial budget issues. And so I think it's easy to send them an email saying, just be careful what you do because it has an impact. Uh, and if they're available, then let us know if there's a, you know, if there's a, a good number of them available. That way we won't be meeting between ourselves and one or somebody like, or some, something like that, okay? Sounds good. All right. Any other questions or anything? Okay, well, no, then we'll move on to the next item in the agenda, which is the reports of uh, activities or uh, events that uh, attended or to be attended on behalf of the county. You may present a brief summary of current events and may update the schedule for future board of supervisor meetings. Appropriate, no legal action will be taken. Supervisor Pancras, do you have anything to report? You always have something to report. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah I do. Um, I attended the Yuma County uh, Chamber of Commerce Legislative Affairs meeting. It was very good. I met with Gil on the budget. Um, I attended the North Star goal setting meeting. Um, um, I attended to YPIC Arizona at Work uh, development meeting. CSA Executive Committee on the amicus brief request. Um, I attended that. Um, and um, I have upcoming this week, there are two PM 10 meetings, one tomorrow and one on Thursday, a CSA board of um, executive board and the director's board meetings this week and um, a learning session on state highways. And I'd also like to um, compliment the city. I attended uh, flag football games all day Saturday and that program out there at the convention center at the at the, um, on the fields out there was so well organized, uh, so well run. Uh, the kids that are playing are just having a fabulous time. And I wanna thank those volunteer coaches, the volunteer, the refs I know aren't volunteer, but the refs for doing it because it's warm and, um, and you have to run up and down the field. But, um, and some of the people that were out there coaching and refing are veterans. I mean, they're veteran coaches and retro, uh, not just veterans for our military, but veteran coaches. They've been around a long time and uh, and they're coaching grandsons and, and nieces and nephews. And uh, it was a very well organized program that the city runs for that program. And um, I want to thank them. So, uh, a number of things that uh, Supervisor Pankras has already mentioned. With CSA, also um, UIDC, 
uh, met with several legislators and representatives from the governor's office, talked about the budget, specifically some of the requests, as uh, it would affect Arizona Western College mm -hmm. and the uh, program out there for law enforcement. And uh, a couple of different senators that came down to, federal senators that came down to view the situation on the border, uh, et cetera. Right. Supervisor Simmons? Uh, just a couple of meetings. I was out of town for most of it, dealing with family matters. Uh, some problems within the district, you know, I gave calls <laughs> on it. But other than that, no. Supervisor Borges. Uh, I attended uh, one of the WCAG meeting committees, or <laughs> one of the many. So many, one of the many. Uh, and uh, also the DYDAC meeting last week. I, I, I want to take the opportunity to thank all those appointees to the commission, to the redistricting commission. That is a tough job. And, uh, you know, whomever has offered themselves or you were ever convinced to participate in it, you know, they are in for a treat. That is, <laughs> <laughs> that is a tough And I want to thank everybody, with the possible exception of, super, of former Supervisor McLeod, which, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, sometimes. You give him nah, the hard time. It, it's good uh, for some things. So, I don't know what yet, but he's not just, <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out that. They're just no, no, you. He's, no, but anyway, no, I'm, I'm serious when I say this. That, that is a very important commission, and uh, they have a tough job to do. So, I'd like to thank them ahead of time, and hopefully, we'll get a good number of quality you know, uh, applicants for that at large position. Um, Susan? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> so, I attended the uh, ACMA board, Arizona City County Management Assistance Association's board retreat uh, since I'm on the board for the next two years. And also the conference planning committee, we're planning for our professional development conference in July upcoming. Uh, we had the county managers and administrators meeting uh, virtually. We are actually planning to do next month's in person, which would be nice to see after more than a year to be able to see my colleagues face to face. And um, <clears throat> tomorrow we're having our ice cream social. So if you'd like to come and oh. have some free ice cream for the ice cream truck, would that be a chicken dance? <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> Last Friday was National Chicken Dance Day, so we had a great group of employees who all joined together, did the chicken dance here outside, and then we down went down to the pint house and did it again. And then we went to Prison Hill and did it again. So and we had a few people that didn't uh, join in with guess. us. So we had a great time. <laughs> I love it. Torture everybody, I guess. I want to see that on the video for county highlights. <laughs> anything anything else? That's it. Thanks. I do. Bill, uh, when you get a chance, tell Johnny we need to be in touch to do that proclamation change. Okay? So tell him that, please. Anything else? Anybody? If not, then thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And this ends the meeting this morning. Alejandro.